generated a population of about 4,000 patients running for 50 years into the future and output uh, 16 different fire resources uh, in the process. Uh, they pretty much line up with the ones that the uh, Argonaut project is, is working on. I haven't done a detailed comparison, but it's, it's got about probably at least an 80% overlap with those. And uh, this database now has been public. It's available. It, we run it 24-7. Uh, we have people hitting on it all over, all over Europe and all over the United States. Um, and one of those populations has been Mark Bronstein and his students at Georgia Tech. And so rather than going into the details of the patient generation, I want to give him as much time as I can to talk about the results because I've never seen them. And I'm expecting a lot. Mark. <laughs> So I've got, do I have 45 minutes? That's what that thing says. Um, anyway, pleasure to be here. Um, you're going to see some stuff that nobody's seen not, uh, today. Can I make this work? No. Oh, that's me. Um, of course, you can't talk about fire without a play on the, the term fire, so that was my, my attempt. I'm uh, a physician by training, not a computer scientist, even though I'm a professor of the practice in this College of Computing at Georgia Tech, uh, where I teach health informatics. Um, we're, my course has been around since 2008. We're trying to develop a whole series of health informatics courses, mostly around big data and analytics with the goal of offering a minor and then eventually degrees. Um, so this is my course, CS6440, uh, Introduction to Health Informatics. I didn't give a lot of thought to the course name eight years ago when I put it out there. I wish I had because you can't change them. Uh, uh, universities are funny creatures, but I cannot change that name. Anyway, um, over the years it's grown from um, five or six students to, uh, I have to cap it now at 60, which is a big graduate course. Um, and uh, I think a lot of that growth has to do with the technologies that the course has moved to and, and, and those that it's moved away from. Um, it's, it's definitely evolved with the rapidly shifting HIT landscape. I want you to think back to nine years ago. Uh, the EMR adoption was near zero. Um, you know, we didn't have the sort of informatics tools we have today. And in fact, it was a, a totally didactic course at the beginning because I couldn't think of any way to give the students uh, a workable, hands-on uh, way to work with health IT in, within the context of a one semester course, particularly since these are students who come to me not even knowing what health is or healthcare is. I mean, they have to, I have to teach them everything in one semester. Uh, so both from the point of view of technology and the structure of the course, it, it's, it's sort of an interesting example of, of where higher education is going. Uh, today it's a flipped classroom, uh, which means that I don't give lectures anymore. I'm sure the students are happy with, about that, uh, but they don't quite get away scot-free. They watch the lectures they would have watched as a MOOC, a Mass Open Online Course. And each week, the, the MOOC is 10 weeks long. Each week, they, they have to watch uh, one lesson, which is a week of material. And they get quizzed on that, which frees up all of the normal classroom time for what I'm going to talk to you about, which is really the more interesting stuff. Um, I have to say, it's also offered as part of our OMSCS program. You, you don't know what that means, but Georgia Tech is unique among uh, top-tier uh, institutes of technology universities, and that you, you can earn a, a real Master's of Science in Computer Science without ever setting foot on campus. Thirty-odd graduate courses are available as MOOCs. These are the same courses taught by the same faculty with the same standards. You apply to the program, you have to meet Georgia Tech admission requirements, um, and you, you, the, the only differences are you t the students typically take only one or two courses at a time, so it takes them longer because these are almost all adults out in the workforce pursuing a master's degree. The other big difference is instead of $45,000, it's $6,000. So today we have over 3,000 students in this program. It's actually 
represents nearly 10% of all master's degrees in computer science in the United States. And my course is offered as an elective in that, and you're going to see and even hear from, from that. The this, this students use the classroom time. I, I'm, when t in talking about the OMSCS students, it's not, I don't know how to talk about classroom because there really isn't one. Uh, they form teams of from four to six. Uh, I strongly encourage them to create multidisciplinary teams, uh, which might include CS students who can write code, human computer action students who are interested in UI design. Uh, industrial engineering students, I always have some of those who are obviously interested in workflow and process. And students from other disciplines, I, I actually get a few brave students from the business school. I've, I've had an Emory medical student come by uh, two or three times, that's always really good. This last time, and that's, this is really the whole point, because of fire, and entirely because of fire, uh, I went over to Emory where I'm well known already, and, and I said, who would like to uh, propose a project? In the past, either I proposed the projects or the students came up with their own projects. And um, actually, every faculty I talked to said, I'd like to do it. So we used the whole first month of the course to have faculty from Emory and from the VA and, and from CDC come over lecture about their particular domain, the particular problem they were interested in. And after all those lectures had been given, the students volunteered, or they sort of sorted themselves out into teams to work with these faculty on these real projects. And you're going to see what those are uh, right now. I'm only going to talk about the on-campus projects. The OMSCS students uh, did the same thing, except I, I don't have people for them to work with. They had to go find their own problems. Um, there are eight teams on campus. There were 35 teams in the OMSCS class, which is 200 students. And these are students all over the world. These are the eight projects that the on-campus students did. Uh, the first is uh, advanced innovative visualization of ICU data in an EICU. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, an EICU is a, 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 a essentially a control center that sits above an actual ICU and is manned 24 by 7 by uh, skilled nurses and physicians to watch over what's going on in several ICUs, in this case five of them, and, and spot problems that the, e, the ICU staff may be missing because they're busy doing something else. The, the next three were all clinical decision support uh, projects. The first is to help determine the optimal initial heparin dose in an ICU environment. The second one is to help surgeons discharge say, uh, patients post-surgery at the correct time so that they don't have um, days in the hospital they don't need to have, but they don't get discharged so early that they come back. You're all familiar with the readmission issue. And the last one is um, helping really house staff make appropriate decisions about when to use blood transfusions. The other four teams worked together with uh, two people from the CDC, one of whom is the ubiquitous Paula Braun, a couple of you know what I'm talking about, on a suite of four apps that together constitute a community-wide pediatric obesity management suite. Um, as I said, I'm not going to talk about the 35 OMSCS projects, but they all fell into one of four categories. Um, this is a requirement. They're either for providers, for patients, the clinical decision support, or population public health. Um, there are other things you can imagine doing with fire, but they had to pick one of those. Um, a, a minute about our infrastructure at Georgia Tech. You, you can ignore everything but the yellow boxes. We've done something that, as far as we know, talking to Rage and Stripe, nobody else has done, which was we've built a fire server on top of OMOP. OMOP is Rage and Stripe's um, clinical data model that, that is very useful for aggregating clinical information for supporting analytics. And, and it sort of mimics, in many ways, an EMR. Um, 
So OMOP is, is, is typically used to, uh, to bring together data from diverse EMRs, even from diverse institutions, into a common data model for research and, and those purposes. What we do is map data sets uh, from various sources, and these are the six that we've mapped so far, into OMOP. Uh, and they, they can then be accessed you know, using our fire server, Tech on Fire, the uh, yellow box in the upper left. To be completely honest with you, only the first one is currently accessible using fire, and this is a synthetic data set that we license from a commercial company. Um, the others are in OMOP, but um, we, we have to upgrade. They're in OMOP 5, and, and our Tech on Fire server is currently OMOP 4. We'll be done upgrading to OMOP 5 by the end of the summer. And then all of these data sets, which include claims data sets, Employers Like Me is a consortium of major employers around Georgia that are working with us, and they contribute their claims to our repository. And so we and relatively soon we'll, we'll be able to have, uh, be working using FIRE on, on claims data sets. Uh, CHOA is uh, the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, the largest pediatric hospital in the country. We have, uh, we're mapping their clinical data repository. Um, IMS is a, a claim set that we got for a special project I'm not really allowed to talk about. Uh, it's with a, a pharma. We've mapped the MIMIC-3 ICU data set. Um, in, into OMOP, and um, we, we have a licensed set of uh, claims from CMS that are not de-identified, so, no, no, but, but we've done that as well. So all of this stuff's going to be fire enabled uh, by the end of the summer. Um, the students have access to two um, Synthetic data sets. The first I've mentioned is Tech on Fire. This is 10,000 chronic disease patients designed to mirror the U.S. This is not the elegant Markov model driven um, synthetic data set that uh, Jeff just described. It's a classical uh, data set based on statistical analysis of, of real patient data. Um, we currently support the seven key fire resources, um, but uh, we've got funding now to. Uh, increase that substantially. So if you want to use this, you're limited to the seven resources that we've mapped to the OMOP data set, if you're following me. We, it's, it's a highly customized FHIR server uh, based on the Happy FHIR code base. Um, thanks to Meehan, I'm eternally grateful, um, the students also had access to around 12,000 simulated persons with an emphasis on diabetes. and. Um, Meehan supports many more fire resources, um, and they also use the Happy Fire code base. And um, the students, if they were doing an IC project, were also allowed to use the MIMIC database, which we didn't yet have. It's still not fire enabled, but it will be soon. Um, and that's actually on the Amazon cloud these days. Um, can you read this? Huh? Well, the, these, these, these are the specifics of our data set, just how many patients, the breakdown by male, female, so on and so forth. And this uh, overview was developed by the, the tool I'm going to show you at the end of my presentation, uh, a population level um, fire tool that we've, we've been working on. Um, This, this just compares the support of fire between Meehan and Tech on Fire. Um, and so there's a lot more resources supported in Meehan. And, and actually, the data set the students are working in are, is a little different. That's why I said Meehan now. This is what Meehan looks like right now. And it was a little different when the students are working on it because Jeff did a, a new run. And I've already mentioned this. Uh, Me Mimic 3, actually, uh, is the definitive data set uh, for ICU patients. It's not yet fire enabled, but people are working on that. In fact, this is a, I'll just skip it. It's, people are working on that, that's sufficient. So let me talk to you about the EICU project. This, this is an actual photo of the EICU. The, um, the guy in the middle on the left there with the headset on is Dr. Tim Buckman, who heads 
the EICU, and the woman at the upper right is Cheryl Hiddleston, his, his chief nurse. So th they were the two that mentored the students. Um, this is the existing infrastructure um, when we started the project. Um, the Phillips Viz ICU system there in the middle is what, what they used to power their ICU. It was developed at Johns Hopkins. It's the, now owned by Phillips, the most widely used EICU software by far in the world. Um, and in the lower right, you can see there is an archive database, which is a near real-time copy of everything that's in the ICU system. And, and that's what we used so that we weren't at risk of disturbing the live production system. So what the students, th their goal was to develop a fire adapter for the archive DV. It's not a fire-enabled system, so basically a fire adapter, and to use it to create a unique visualization, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, um, this summer, they're over at Emory using further enhancing the tool they developed against live real patient data. You can't really do that in a course. Um, so we used the, the synthetic data, in this case from our Tech on Fire server, um, to get the, the software developed and tested. And, and I can't overemphasize the importance of synthetic data particularly in the early stages of development and testing. The, the overhead and the complexity that gets introduced into a development process if you're using real patient data, even if it's de-identified data, the need for IRBs and all this sort of stuff is a real burden and, and virtually makes it impossible to do this within the context of a real course because there's just not enough time. Um, the the only part of, so this entire project was done with two fire resources, patient, whoops, what did I just do? Nope, patient and observation, because I'll, I'll show you that it's really about um, an innovative way of looking at creatinine levels in, in patients with uh, renal failure. Um, the, the only thing that was real in this data were the creatinine values, and they were date shifted, so they they can be viewed as synthetic. So that's all the students worked with. They had to get it um, from the archive database system. So they wrote a fire adapter which used SQL, because it's, it's SQL, it's a Microsoft SQL server based system, used SQL to get the data um, and then they converted the data to fire resources. And of course their software also had to uh, uh, respond appropriately to the, the APIs. In this case, just just gets, that's just read, no, no writing. They're gonna be doing writing uh, this summer. Um, I don't have time to get into details, but it's, for those of you who are clinical, it turns out, and Dr. Buckman has written a paper on this, is, and what we did was make it live, that the, the, the typical way of visualizing creatinine is, is creatinine level over time. And he's shown rather definitively that if you're looking at that and you're a clinician, you're going to uh, not recognize that the patient's renal function has already started to recover until quite a while after it's already started to recover, which leads to inappropriate treatment. If you, if you plot the first derivative of creatinine over time, you, you'll recognize it much sooner. So that's basically what the students did. Uh, this is a simple proof of concept. The, the plan is to implement a whole suite of visual analytics tools using FHIR against this uh, EICU system. And as I said, Emory's hired my students to work on that this summer. Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna do a number of things which I'll, including user testing. In the interest of time, I'll move on. The second project is blood transfusion clinical decision support. Blood transfusions are expensive, they're also dangerous. Um, and um, it, it turns out that physicians, particularly house staff, use them far often than they should. Um, the, the, this project, the details of which I can't reveal to you, there's IPS, uh, there's IP issues at, at Emory, um, use the MEHIN um, synthetic data set quite successfully. 
And uh, among other things, the students created a dashboard uh, so that the uh, attending physicians could understand uh, a number of key characteristics about the uh, use of blood transfusions in the intensive care unit. Um, they used a procedure request fire resource because, in fact, um, the, the system in, uh, in invo involves some level of overview of the uh, decision to um, do a blood transfusion. Again, I can't tell you the details. Um, the obesity suite, as I said, is a, is a set of connected apps. And there are four of them. I don't know that this diagram is really that, that good, actually. There's one for the provider. There's one for the patient. There's one for a care coordinator. And the fourth is a reporting app. And these, these apps share data, um, something that uh, there isn't a lot of out there yet. So it's really a system. Um, I'll tell you at the outset, this project was so successful that the students are working with the CDC this summer. Uh, we actually did this project twice. Well, the the, the on-campus students did it, and separately the OMS CS students did it. We're taking the best ideas from both, and we're building an integrated system that we, we hope to take out into the WIC uh, community in a county north of Atlanta and, and actually try this one in the real world. Um, this is uh, the provider app. I show you this only so you can see the fire resources that were used all from Meehan. Thank you again, E. Jeff. Um, and you can see that someone mentioned the question, structured questionnaire, I think was mentioned, was it in the, the last presentation before? You can see they, they use the uh, questionnaire and the questionnaire response resource, um, referral request resource. You, you, I'm gonna actually show you some of this in a minute. Um, this is one of, I, I'm, I'm going to briefly show you the two patient apps from the on-campus and off-campus team. This team focused on food identity. You actually used a, uh, a visual analytics engine on the web. You, the patient could take a picture of whatever they were eating and the uh, software would identify it. And it actually quite accurately, unless it was beef stew or something like that, but it was, it's, they had it in there present final presentation they, it was pretty impressive what what they were able to do they had a BMI calculator um, they had patients collecting data about their own activity and health um, and they actually created a social network where the patients using this could share ideas about what they're eating and uh, good rest healthy recipes this sort of thing a very I thought clever group of students the second team used a web app um, that uh, tr tracked patients' uh, habits, and, and this app produces the questionnaire, structured questionnaire resource we talked about earlier. Um, the care coordinator app, of course, is where just about everything comes together. Um, you can see the list of fire resources that it uses. And, um, and uh, the, the reporting app did all the stuff you'd expect a reporting app to do. Um, now we're leaving students behind us. I, I was billed as showing you how synthetic data, and all this is done with synthetic data, most of it from me him, because they support so many more resources. Um, so I, I, I was billed as also explaining how synthetic data might be used in research. I'm going to show you that now. So, uh, and one of the limitations of FHIR as it currently exists is it's really focused around one patient at a time. Um, if, if you want to get data about a lot of patients, you're, you're talking about quite a number of API calls. And if, you do, if you're working with a real EMR system or something like that, um, that, that could really be a problem. So how, how might you use FHIR in a, in a population level um, reporting uh, management system? So we, we, a group, group of us have been doing a, a research project around that. And we've never shown any of this publicly before. 
and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail since it's not published yet, but I'll just, just to give you an idea of what can be done. And Meehan's synthetic data has been really critical to this, although I can't advance. Huh? Okay. Um, we, Vera, we, I didn't like the name, but one of the students came up with fire plug, and that's what we're using. So the first thing in the upper left, and I realize you can't see it, there's a drop down. This tool is connected to our, our server and Mihin. So you can pick the server you want to do the an analytics on. A demonstration of interoperability, because that's all you have to do. Um, the first analysis it does is the overview, which is what I showed you earlier about uh, our data. So you can look at a, an entire server and see how many patients there are, what, uh, some, uh, how many observations there are, how many medications, just get a sense of <coughs> what's in that data set. Um, now, synthetic data isn't perfect. This is actually a cartoon somebody put together trying to show that. Um, and there are clearly limitations in both of the synthetic data sets that we work with, and they show up when you do these, these large-scale analytics. I'm not going to embarrass... Uh, Jeff by showing him a couple of those, but um, but they're more. I'm done. <laughs> Is this the PDF? No. What happened? I may not come back. I don't know. <laughs> um, the point is that there, these synthetic data sets have been absolutely invaluable in developing this tool. Uh, and we, they, all the burdens of IRBs and data use agreements and all that stuff goes away. Where are the rest of my slides? Huh. No, I'm at the end. No, the slides are gone. Here. Can you do the USB stick? Yeah. yeah. No, I get they've got the USB stick. I don't understand because I took the stuff right off of the, it worked on my computer at Georgia Tech. and I do have a nice notebook. Georgia Tech's good about that. So I was just going to show you various, um, population level visual analytics we're doing with uh, the Mihin data set and with our data set. If, if we can't get this up really quickly, I'll just describe them. You can just use your imagination. Um, any questions before I've even finished since we're short on time? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, they're using fire to go into the, well, this is the, well, there's, it's all, all simulated, but they're imagining that there are, prob there's, there are problems inherent in the patient's record that aren't very explicitly being, that's a common problem, by the way. Um, and they're mapping the problems to HCC, and they're doing a, a standard risk assessment. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, let me back. Can I back up? Yeah. So I'll just briefly describe um, the. Um, so again, this is the entire data set. Uh, you can do a. There are tabs across the top which you can't see. Um, there are, there's a clinical tab in which based on, you pick it up, so you pick a data set, you pick a, a fire server, then you pick up a problem. And then once you've picked the fire server, uh, the, the, the drop down list of problems is dynamic. So it's only problems that are represented within the data set on that server. You, you pick a problem of interest and then um, we intelligently display six uh, clinical 
um, observations that are important to that particular problem all on the screen at once. You can see the distribution of values related to those all on one screen. You can add others. Um, there's a, um, a process tab is the next one and, and, and it shows you things like how frequently these patients are being seen for outpatient encounters, how frequently they're being hospitalized, the average length of stay, or the distribution of lengths of stay, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Again, it's all make-believe data, but it, it's actually pretty interesting to look at the distributions, not that you would publish them. Uh, we have a, a cost tab. We, we supplemented the fire resources outside of fire with cost data so that we can uh, take the, the lab tests, medications, encounters, hospitalizations patients have and calculate um, uh, synthetic costs in essence. Um, and then we have a demographic tab which allows you to break the, the patients down according to various demographic factors. And then we have a view download tab. The whole thing is cross-filtered so you can take any of these displays and narrow it down. I'm, I'm only interested in patients whose hemoglobin A1C is between X and Y and all of the other displays are then narrowed down to those patients dynamically in real time. And if you go to the view download tab, you, you see a list of the patients who meet whatever criteria you specify and you can actually download them. So I think that's, this is indicative of what you're going to see uh, happening a lot in the future, which is people building structures on top of fire that allow you to look at large populations of data all at once. Now I'll be happy to answer any questions. I apologize for the, all the technical problems. Probably all my fault. I don't understand how the slides went on. I got it. My question would be about the onboarding of the students. Uh, they appear to have gotten a lot done with FIRE. Could you explain how you introduced your students to learning FIRE, using FIRE, how long did it take, and did they do it themselves, or do you have a process to educate them? Um, so these are Georgia Tech students. I mean, these are really, really smart kids. Um, you, you basically just point them in the right direction, and they figure it all out on their own. Um, uh, obviously, I'm available to answer questions. We have a PhD computer scientist who runs our lab who's there to help with questions. And we always have a TA who's e e experienced in the, in the course and has been working with the lab who can help them with technical issues because they're always technical issues. Fi to a, a smart Georgia Tech student, FIRE is simple. People have been telling you that all day long. I'm, I'm giving you proof. Uh, to them, REST APIs, JSON, I mean, this is all, you know. What they don't understand is what an ICD-9 code is or what a, what a SNOMED code is, and I teach them that in the course. Um, I mean, it's amazing. This is a three-month long course, or four months, I guess, January, February, March, April, with all the vacations and breaks. It's, and they go from knowing nothing to developing. If, I wish you could have seen this care coordinator app. I mean, it's really impressive in, in four months. Yes? I just want to piggyback off that same question, which is where I think it was going. For those of us who aren't brilliant Georgia Tech students, where can we go uh, based on your recommendation to learn these types of All right. Of, uh, so um, a little self-promotion here. I, I have a Coursera MOOC free. So you can't beat it, it's free. Um, it's actually the first of two. The second one will go up, I hope, this fall. Um, and if you take them both, you, you will have a pretty good working knowledge of fire and, and, and how, how to, and you'll be able to play with it using some special tools that we've developed at Georgia Tech that are really designed for totally non-technical people. Um, that is my objective. Actually, my real objective, is, since I'm an MD, is to figure out how to teach medical students this stuff. So you've got to figure out how to make it really clear and really simple, but interesting for non-technical students. And um, I've had a lot of doctors take the first MOOC, so, and I've gotten real positive feedback. So that's where I'm personally trying to go. And the second one will be up this fall. You can go take the first one now. It's only four hours long, so. 
Um, yes? So in answer to that question, uh, whoever asked it, um, their fire tutorials are online. Even if you just go to LinkedIn and, and uh, uh, Google uh, fire tutorials, all their presentations are, are free. Um, you might not get the audio on it. Uh, but uh, I'm supporting the Fire Foundation, which is uh, looking to uh, develop the whole pathway to uh, help developers. And so we're trying to gather all the information that is available around the community, the links, the servers, the tutorials, and a pathway to train. So uh, we're trying to address that in a, in a more formal way. But right now, most of it is, is bootstrapping. You, you take a short course, and then you jump in with a happy server. Right. And, and a connect with them. Yeah, what I'm trying to do with the Coursera MOOC is for totally non-technical students. I mean, I'm not trying to teach a programmer how to use Fire. I'm actually trying to show a doctor or a consumer or, or an interested someone in a hospital. Those are the kind of people that take the MOOC. What this is and give them a feel for how it works. And when the second one is done, uh, they can actually play with it in a very simple, non-technical way. Because I, I love, somebody showed a slide of actually showing doctors using a ClinFire, you know, how to, how to build a fire resource center. It's kind of stuff I think we need more and more of. I mean, doctors need to be rolling up, just like these Emory doctors did, rolling up their sleeves and getting involved in these projects. But they have to be comfortable with this whole milieu, and, and they can be. There's no question about it. So... A couple of quick points that I haven't heard made yet, and then I'll shut up. Um, fire is important for a lot of reasons, but we're, we're sort of touched on touching on one right now. Yeah, I believe it will attract talent into this field, young talent. Believe me, I can tell you firsthand, you're not going to attract young talent to this field by expecting them to plow through a CCDA. You're just not. Um, when I started re-advertising my course as learn how to use JSON objects and REST APIs to, to build he mobile health apps, the, I went from you know 15 or 20 students to, even though it's, it's limited at 60, there's a waiting list of kids because they understand that. And um, we need young people with innovative ideas. It's, God, it's killing me that that video didn't work. I'll find a way to post it so you can all, I'll, get, I'll post it somewhere and send, they can send a link out to everybody. Um, thing about these students is, like, like the, the patient app people, you, you know, we're going to identify the food. You, they don't know that it can't be done, you know. They, they, and, um, and, you know, obviously you want to create a social network among these, these people, and we need more of that. This has been, I've been in this field since the very beginning. I got started in 1969. And um, we didn't do a whole lot in 40 years, you know. It was sort of the same stuff. I've seen more change in the last few years than in the previous 40, and I think it's just wonderful. And fire is really at the heart of most of it. Yes. Yeah, hey, Mark. Um, Jeff lives safe in my hand. If you can't see me from there, who knows when the power might go out. Um, we regret the AV difficulties here today, but we do know um, that you're doing outstanding work at Georgia Tech and you're blazing a trail that uh, some other universities are following. Um, Harvard wants to use the fire resources, uh, Children's Harvard, uh, generated by the patient gen when they heard about your work, I think, from you. Yeah, well, um, I went up and showed them what we were doing. Exactly. Yeah. And now um, the University of Michigan, which also has some great students, maybe not such a great football team, but um, sorry, state fan, state fan. I, I, I don't know. Go if Green. If Michigan to, played Georgia Tech, I'd put my money on Michigan. They do have great students. And um, so uh, they are now interested in following. They're usually out in front, but uh, this time it's you. <laughs> and so we want to thank you. I think there's probably a button on that thing that advances to the end. Um, so that might be one of the bugaboos, but with the, the video, um, we will make sure that it is available to everyone here through our website, with your permission, of course, so that they will get to see that because you are um, truly a trailblazer and a pioneer in what you're doing at Georgia Tech. And uh, I know this was difficult uh, with all of the, the outage and the AV problems, but still you have shown us some wonderful materials 
and uh, I would really encourage folks to go to the deck and um, on the site when it's published and, and go through that, watch the video, and see the rest of what um, Mark uh, was trying to tell you here today. Well, I want to turn that around again. I, I, I've come to believe synthetic health data is, is a critical issue. And um, to my knowledge, Meehan has done the most advanced work that's been done to date in that. And I'm, I hope that they and others, we, we can form some sort of a collaborative and really make this uh, the, the rich, robust national resource that we, we all need. So thank you for inviting me here today. I cannot.